Thank you for that testimony. That was wonderful. Good to hear what God's doing in hearts and lives. Appreciate the testimonies that are given. Uh, testimonies are an interesting thing in the Christian economy. Uh, they are very humbling uh, for those who give them. They're exposing, and uh, they should be an encouragement to all of us. So thank you. Appreciated the testimonies I've been hearing, and I'm looking forward to uh, um, some more testimonies as the Lord leads us along. You know, it's hard to be way up here when you're <clears throat> almost six and a half feet tall. You feel like your head's almost touching the ceiling up here. So if I, if I come down here, this thing's really high, and it's bouncy, and I'm nervous when I get high. So um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, we'll figure that out. First John in your Bible, if you don't mind going there, I want to preach this, a message this morning uh, about is it real? Is it real? I've been super encouraged with a lot of the preaching that we've been hearing, and I'm excited for the journey the Lord has been leading us down, and I'm looking forward to the opportunity to share just some things God's done in my own personal life. And uh, uh, really helpful from First John here. I think uh, we'll be encouraged by it. If you found First John uh, chapter number one, go down to verse number three. We'll read this, then we'll pray, and uh, we'll get into our message here this morning. First John chapter one, verse number three. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. Jesus Christ. Let's pray here together this morning. Father, again, thank you for the privilege you give us to gather together. Thank you for these young people. Uh, thank you for these testimonies, especially from the, uh, yesterday and today from these young ladies who are uh, choosing you over the things of this world. We pray that there will be many young people here today uh, that will be making those choices uh, throughout this, uh, this time together. Uh, Lord, bless our meeting together. Help us as we uh, come to you to open the word of life. And uh, Lord, give us liberty from your word today. We trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I was a little discouraged. I opened up the pamphlet here the other day. I was looking to see how many pastors were here at the meeting. And I noticed doctor, doctor, evangelist, evangelist. And then there was this Pastor Weber. And I'm like, oh man, am I the only pastor? And then I saw the split session and there was Pastor Rhonda Van Gelder. And I thought, whew, I'm all right. <laughs> Just kidding, kind of. Anyway, is it real? Do you have a real relationship with Jesus Christ? Is it real? Uh, we live in a world that is generating pseudo everything. And uh, our, our, our bios, our life, who we are, uh, everything about us has become really fake. You know, what you post on your social media account, all that stuff. I mean, how many of us spend more time posting on our social media account than humiliating times when God brings us down and shows us who we really are? Who, who posts those moments? Who spends, you know, 10 to 15 minutes on a YouTube channel talking about, you know, the failures and the weaknesses of their own life? Who does those things? And the reality is, is the majority of people don't. I'm sure there's some, but ma majority of the people don't. And that's why I say those testimonies, those are, those, are, those are monumental moments in our lives when we hear people come up and talk about sin issues in their lives and, and are willing to stand in front of their peer group and say these things. It's, it's exciting because it's exposing and it's, and it's bringing out a genuineness, a reality. Uh, you know, I think in life there's, there, there, there's a need, especially today, for reality, young people. You need to get to a point where you are... Uh, uh, excited and looking forward to and cultivating something real. I think Pastor mentioned uh, yesterday in his message in the evening service about taking off the mask. And it's about time that Christians, especially in our conservative circles, take off the mask. And young people, you have a great opportunity to do it. We've got a lot of things that can cover up who we really are. Our combed over hair, our fancy little outfits, our cool Bible versions, our apps, our social media accounts, our instruments, our sports. And we can hide behind all kinds of things and make everybody think that it's real, that it's genuine. But, you know, at the end of the day, there's only one person that knows it's, whether it's real or not, and that's you and the Lord. John's writing here in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in First John here, and he's, he's writing about having fellowship with Jesus Christ. In the several verses before verse 3 there, 
He, he talks about uh, this relationship, this fellowship, things uh, about uh, this relationship with God that was real. It wasn't some cloud relationship. It wasn't some mysterious place. It was something that they'd seen, something they had touched, something uh, that was exposed to them. It was real, genuine fellowship. You could read the verses later. You'll have to forgive me. I'm going to make reference to a lot of Bible verses. I may not give you the actual references as we go. I'm assuming in our context here, you understand what I'm talking about. So John's talking about this real relationship. And so again, I ask you, do you have it? Is it real to you? Do you have a real relationship? I have... Uh, uh, the other day I was, uh, um, I was at church and a uh, sweet lady in our church came, came to church in the morning. I'm in the lobby talking to folks and she said, you know, Pastor Weber, uh, I just want you to know I made you a raspberry pie. Ooh, I like raspberry pie. It was fresh raspberries right from the garden, handmade crust. I was like, where'd you put that raspberry pie? She said, I put it on your table at the parsonage. I was like, thank you so much. And uh, after church, sh shook hands, did the stuff you do, went back to the parsonage, walked in the door and was like, oh, the raspberry pie. Oh, I opened up the lid because it was in a container, didn't want it to get ruined. Opened up the lid and, oh, you know what I'm talking about, right? Amen. Mm. Put the cover back on as to not let all the goodness escape. Set it aside because we had to eat lunch first. And I don't know, why do we do that? Why do we eat lunch before we eat dessert? Shouldn't we eat dessert first? Yeah. Why ruin dessert by eating lunch first? <laughs> anyway, so we had lunch. And uh, the kids were, you know, not, not, not doing well at eating lunch. So I just said, you know what? I'm going to start eating my pie. And I said, honey, where's that, where's that ice cream? Because you can't eat raspberry pie without ice cream. I mean, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this the right way. She's like, well, we don't have any. What do you mean we don't have any? Well, we, we just, it's not in our fridge. It's at the store fridge, but we don't have any here at this fridge. <laughs> it's like, that's a good point. So I was like, well, what we'll do is we'll wait till later. Why don't you, you go to the store this afternoon? We'll get some, and we'll have some pie before church tonight. She's, okay, good idea. So I do what everybody should do on Sunday is I take my nap. And uh, I wake up in the afternoon, and I'm ready to go. Where's that pie? And I, honey, where's that ice cream? She's like, oh, I went to the store, and I forgot the ice cream. Oh, gracious, what are we going to do with you? <laughs> anyway. Boy, if she were here, I'd be in huge trouble. <laughs> we pack up the pie. We put it in the fridge. We'll eat it tomorrow when we go back to our house, and we'll eat it after dinner when I get home from work. Okay, that sounds good. We have a parsonage, and then we have a different house, and we go back to the different house for other reasons. But anyway, so I came home from church that afternoon, was super excited, looked in the freezer. First thing I did, what did I see? Ice cream. Perfect. We eat dinner kids again messing around they're not eating I don't know what's wrong with you people why you can't just eat your dinner and get it done with but you know it's just the way it works they're over there messing around I'm like I cannot wait this is killing me I've been waiting two days for this thing I go in the refrigerator I pull it out I set it on the counter I go to the fridge I get out that vanilla ice cream I take it off I'm pulling bowls and plates and knives and spoons and all kinds of gadgets this that and the other thing and I'm lining it up on the couch and, or on the counter, and I'm looking at the kids. I'm going, you guys should hurry up because I'm going to have this thing gone by the time you guys are done. Pull off the little little bit. It doesn't smell the same as it did yesterday. That's all right. Ice cream will fix that. I don't have to worry about anything. So I'm getting the ice cream lid off. I'm doing all the stuff that I need to do. And sure enough, I pull off the lid. I get out the little pie scooper. And I want to get down a little bit closer to see... Why this? It just doesn't smell the same. And that's when I saw it. And I stepped back. And I said, honey, I can't eat this pie. She said, why not? I said, because we have a real problem. She's like, what do you mean? I said, honey, I can't believe this. There's worms all over the raspberry pie. She's like, no, there's not. She said, you're not telling me the truth. I said, no, honey, I'm being honest with you. 
get over here. And she got over there, and sure enough, there were worms crawling all over my raspberry pie. Now, one day, some of you will understand my dilemma. I couldn't under... <laughs> what do you do? I am ready to eat. I do not need the extra protein, though, because I do not want to eat this thing and then have to take a cleanse afterwards. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. It was like I was living in a fantasy world. Is this real? Is this really happening? I've been looking forward to this moment for a couple of days, and now it's being dashed right in front of my eyes. The hardest part is this is one of the dear ladies in my church who wanted to bless her pastor, and I just couldn't eat it. I saw her a couple days later. Pastor, how was the pie? Well, let me tell you about your pie. <laughs> that was a real moment I had, and it was a bad one. The hardest part was telling her. The second hardest part was when she made me a second pie. <laughs> I waited two days, didn't see anything, took a few bites. It was amazing. I told her it was wonderful. <laughs> Do you have something real? Is it real? Is it real? This was fresh fruit, man. It was real. You could tell even the bugs loved it. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. It was real. But let me ask you about that relationship, your relationship with Jesus Christ. John says it's real. And what we're declaring unto you is something that's real. He says, not just for us. It's real for anybody. It's real for everybody. Listen, I love coming here because, you know, the reality is you guys aren't a bunch of rebels, maybe one or two or three among you. I mean, let's be honest. You guys aren't here because you're in rebellion. You're here because your youth pastor put you in the van and he told you you better get up there. I mean, <laughs> no, you're up here because you, you want to be a part of something. You want to do something. But, you know, I just fear in these days because of the world you live in because of the way you're being influenced that, you know, it, it, what you think is real isn't quite real according to the way that God wants it to be real. And we got caught up, you know, the, in, in, in the world in which we live, we're manipulated by things. Pastor and I were, were, were talking about, you know, the sicknesses and the things going on in this world. You can tell people who are really uh, influenced by television and stuff because they begin to use the talking points of television. They use, we don't have television at our house. We don't do that uh, because we're more spiritual. We watch YouTube. So, uh, <laughs> oh man, uh, how do I do this now? I'm in trouble. Um, but we begin to be influenced like we heard about yesterday and we begin to use the same talking points and we begin to use these, these things in our life and all of a sudden it begins to expose what's really going on in our lives. So uh, we want to talk about a real relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and the important part here that we understand is that it, it, what it is not. Do you have a relationship? Because if you have something real, what it is not is it's not about performing. That's right. Amen. It's not about performing. Jesus never in the word of God ever asks us to perform. He's not a puppet master, uh, you know, with these strings tied around our lives saying, do this, do that, do this. Jesus is looking for a willing heart. If it was about performance, he would have forced you into salvation. He would have forced you into the kind of life that he wants you to live. He doesn't want a performer. He wants a willing heart. Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter number three. He says, you know, if anybody who, who, who's going who's gonna to talk about how much uh, performance level they have, I the more. I was circumcised the eighth day. I come from the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrew. If anybody's going to talk about performance, listen, I'm the one who's got the, uh, uh, I've got the pedigree for it. So I can do the, the performance thing. I did it my whole life. You know, and I just wonder at times, young people, because because you want to serve the Lord, because you've got a heart for God, you begin to confuse reality with performance. You begin to think, man, if I can hit those notes or if I can play that instrument or if I can wear these clothes or if I can meet this standard or if I can do these things and if I can win these souls, if I can pray for this hour, if I can read these Bible verses, then maybe, 
God will do something with my life. And I can see it can get confusing sometimes because you want to do what's right and you're pliable and I appreciate that. But young people, God never asks you to perform. You know, performance is a religion. That's right. hey, listen, you go to any of your Catholic relatives or friends or neighbors, you go to any of those denominational religions and ask them, how are you going to get to heaven? Well, if I do these things, right. if I live this life, if I have these religious activities, if I belong to this church, if I wear this, if I do that, then God will accept me. And what do we tell them? It's not about religion. It's about a relationship. And then we come to our churches. And then we wear the same things spiritually. We put on, no, no, it's about a relationship. But, you know, hey, I've got to wear these clothes to be right with God. I've got to do this and I've got to do that. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. There are some things that God asks us to do, but it's not about gaining his acceptance. Amen. So, young people, I'm encouraging you here today, be careful about this real relationship with Jesus Christ. Because the enemy is very subtle at twisting things for you. It's not about performance to gain his acceptance. I, listen, I've talked to too many Catholic people who say that if I, if I live a good life, and I stand before Peter at the pearly gates, and if my good works outweigh my bad works, and you go to any religion from Islam Hinduism, all of it, it's all built on the same thing because it all comes from the pit of hell. Performance, acceptance. It's terrible and it's killing us. What it is about, it's about a real relationship. If I were to ask you today, think about this for a minute. Just pause for a moment. If I were to ask you today, what does it mean to have a real relationship with Jesus Christ? What would you say? Think about it for a minute. You know, I ask this often in times in our uh, independent, fundamental, conservative circles. What does it mean to have a real relationship with Jesus Christ? You know what often I get is a blank stare. Huh. Yes, sir. What does that mean? Or I get the list of things. You got to wear these clothes. You got to have this Bible version. You got to go to this church. You got to this, that, and then go down the list. Listen, young people, one day you'll understand this when you get married, but a real relationship is not built off the works that you do. Listen, if I were right with my wife because I cut the grass, I'm in huge trouble today, by the way, because it's been a couple of weeks since I cut the grass, okay? In fact, she sent me a picture this morning of a big buck standing in my backyard, backyard, right out my window, eating the grass that I did not cut. <laughs> If my relationship with my spouse is built on my performance, I am in huge trouble. Right. And if your relationship with Jesus Christ is built on your performance, you know you're in huge trouble too. Yes. So I've been uh, on a personal journey here for uh, many years now, trying to understand this real relationship with Jesus Christ. And John talks about it right here in 1 John chapter number 1. He's saying this is about fellowship with Jesus Christ. This is, this is a wonderful thing. And he says when you get a hold of this fellowship, when you get a hold of this idea of a relationship, it will bring unbelievable joy to your life. Verse 4. You can have it. It will bring joy. You'd say, Pastor Weber, what's the real relationship? I'm going to go down three of those things here, and we're going to spend more time on one of them. Context will help us with that. But three aspects that I'm going to give you, I've got about five of them, but I'm going to go over three of them right now. The first one is unconditional love. There is no such thing as a real relationship that does not have the footing of unconditional love. If it's not there, it's over. Okay? You'd say, Pastor Weber, where does it say in the Bible that Jesus Christ loves us unconditionally? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world... That's it. For God so loved the world. You'd say, but that doesn't mean it's unconditional. Well, yeah, it does. Because he didn't say, I love the good people. I love the conservative Baptist. I only love these people. He loves everybody. 
you'd say, you got a better text? Sure. How about Romans 5, 8? For God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In our worst condition, in the worst possible place you could have ever been in your life, as far from God as you are ever in your life, Jesus Christ loved you so much, he died for you. It wasn't built on your performance. You couldn't have performed well enough to get him on that cross. He didn't go to the cross because you know how to play a violin, or because you know how to play a trumpet, or because you know how to scream at a youth rally, or because of the clothes that you wear. He died on the cross because he loves you so much. And he wants to have a real relationship for you. Yes. Yesterday, I'm wrestling with different things in my own life and uh, talking to my wife, working through some things that we're working through. And uh, the Lord, whenever I'm struggling with my wife, always brings me back to husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And then I always remembering that when Jesus says that he loves the church, he loves the church unconditionally. So no matter how many things uh, my wife may offend me knowingly or unknowingly do to me, my correct response, spiritually enabled, is unconditional love. And when I unconditionally love my wife, it opens me up to do anything for her to rescue her or our relationship out of something where God doesn't want it to be. Because when somebody is being unconditionally loved, they have the ability then to sacrifice. Do you know when you unconditionally love the Lord, you will sacrifice anything for him? There is nothing that you will withhold from him. He loved you so much, he sacrificed himself. And I think, and think about this, young people. We're talking about a, a world in need. We're talking about your generation being the generation of change. We're, we're talking about desperate people out there looking for help, looking for hope in any way they can. And they're looking for a generation like you. Do you love Jesus unconditionally? Do you have an unconditional love relationship with him? Because according to 1 John, a little later in chapter 4, it says we love him because he first loved us. So there's this reciprocal love where we're embracing Jesus' love and therefore we're able to respond in unconditional love and therefore when Jesus says he's willing to go to any lengths, he's willing to do anything to, to love us, we're willing then to respond to his love with unconditional love, which means we love him so much we're willing to do anything for him. I was reminded of, of, of people loving the Lord with all their heart soul, mind, and strength, right? Jesus says these are, uh, th this commandment, uh, uh, these two, in fact, in chapter 22 of Matthew, says uh, uh, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. He says, for upon uh, these two things hangs all the law and the prophets. These two things, loving God and loving your neighbor. And I was reminded of that on this last Sunday, we had Brother Jeremy over and he was showing a video of some of the things that are happening in the Middle East and just seeing those men and women being hanged for their faith. That's what we do at our missions conference. We show all our kids people dying for Jesus. Just kidding. It just happened to be in his video. <laughs> but they love Jesus unconditionally and they're willing to die for him. And when you begin to love Jesus with all your heart and when you let him open up your heart, he, he will change things. It'll change the way you view life. It will cease to be about you and your dress and your music and all that stuff and it'll be about him. It'll change you, young people. Another part of this relationship is trust. Again, these are foundational things, young people. It's not about your performance. It's, it's about unconditional love. You don't have a relationship with somebody if love's not there. And, and listen, if there's no trust there, what are you going to do? Listen, if, if you don't ever trust God to walk you through these phases of life, who are you trusting in? Your friends? Your social media uh, following? Who are you trusting? Yourself? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is trust in the Lord with 
all thine heart, not some of your heart, all of your heart. You know, if, if you only trusted in God, let's, let's say you've got your heart here and, and you said, you know, Lord, I, I want to trust you with all my heart, but, uh, you know, I just, I just don't know if I'm, I'm ready to give everything. So I'm just going to hold on to this part about my future and I'm just going to set it over here because you just never know. I, I may want to make a decision later that, that may change things and I don't know if I'm just ready to make that kind of decision yet. So, Lord, I, I'm just going to hold on to that. And, you know, when it comes to my future spouse, Lord, I know you can leave me. I mean, of course, the Bible says you can. But, you know, I'm just going to set this piece of my heart over here and, and hang on to that till later. And we can talk about that later. And, and you know, I've got these other things that I'm just not quite ready to. And, uh, but, Lord, I've got this little piece. I'll trust you with this part. And you're not trusting God with all your heart. See, because young people, you've got to understand this. When you trust somebody, you're willing to give them anything. If I trusted you, I would give you my car keys. You don't have my car keys. <laughs> if I trusted you, I would give you the keys to my house. You don't have the keys to my house. I don't have the keys to my house. <laughs> if I trusted you, I would let you take my kids away from me. But I don't trust you to touch my kids. My wife doesn't trust me with the kids. <laughs> the other day, she's like, honey, I'm going to the store. We live out in the woods. Going to the store is a drive. OK, sounds good. The baby's sleeping. Mickey's in bed. The other two are doing school in the schoolroom. Okay, sounds good. I'm doing something important. Can't remember what it was, but it was important. <laughs> sounds good, honey. Matthew, did you just hear what I said? Of course I heard what you said. You're going to the store. No, no, no. I said I'm leaving kids here. <laughs> right. That's fine. Matthew, <laughs> two of them are in bed. Two of them are in the schoolroom. What am I going to come back to? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so she leaves and texts me I left kids at the house did you understand what I was saying <laughs> she doesn't trust me for good reason <laughs> I let them play with tools that's why and two of them decided to sword fight with my flat saws So I was the one who had to take him to the hospital. He didn't lose all his finger, just half of it. It was okay. <laughs> Do you know in verse 10 it says, if we say that we have, no, we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. If we trusted God, he could talk to us about anything. And we would be willing to give up everything. If we trusted God to talk to us about the sin and the things that mess up this relationship with God, we would be willing to give up anything. We would be willing to say anything. If we say that we have not sinned, it's because we don't trust him. And we love ourselves more than we love him. And you know what that does? is it makes God a liar. Does, is our God a liar? God is not man that he should lie. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, by that two immutable things in that which it is impossible for God to help me out. Lie. God is light, according to this text here that we're reading from in 1 John. It says in verse 5, This then is the message which we heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness, including lying. So when God's talking to us, he's not telling us a lie. He's not saying things that are inappropriate or disguised in some 
some way is to confuse us. He's trying to develop within you a personal relationship with him that you're going to desperately need when you get out there. Where's your heart today, young people? Are you willing to trust him? It was fascinating to me when I first got saved. It, it made sense to me. If Jesus has the power to wash away all my sins and take me to heaven, then I, I should be able to trust him with any area of my life. So I, I told him, I said, Lord, since you have the power to wash away my sins and take me to heaven, then I believe you have the power to take away my addictions. I can trust you with those. I, I don't have to struggle. I don't have to fret. I don't have to worry. I can trust you with those things. And because I can trust you with those things, uh, you can deal with them. And when I made that decision to give those things to him, he took them all away. Boom, immediately they were all gone. And young people, I want to encourage you here today that God is powerful and he can deal with things and he can help us through this life because the reality is it's not just about, uh, it's not just about unconditional love. It's not just about trust. It's also about honesty. If you're going to have a real relationship with Jesus Christ, if we're going to see this thing really happen, if we're going to be the the generation, if we're going to go out there like soldiers and good soldiers, I was reading through 2 Timothy today, and, and about good soldiers, about soldiers who are honest and have a real relationship with their commander, their, their uh, uh, chief in command, if we're going to have a real relationship, then we're going to need to be honest about the things that are happening in our life so that he can help us through those moments. Are you honest with Jesus today, is, I guess is where, is it real? Because this is what a real relationship is all about. It's about being honest. The Bible here says if we confess our sins, verse 9, and confession is homilago, it's the same saying the same thing. And we say the same thing that Jesus says about the things in our life that hinder us. And we say the same thing about our viewing issues that Jesus says. We're going to be honest we're going to say the same thing about wasting time on, on our video games and on our social media accounts. We're going to say the same thing about, Je about what Jesus says about our life, that it's not where he wants it to be. He wants us to be here, and we're standing over here, and we're professing to be the kind of Christian that God wants us to be, and we're displaying a false, a pseudo-Christianity when the reality is Jesus wants us over here, and we're not honest. Uh, and Paul says in the book of Ephesians that we're to put on the belt of truth. And it's, it's not the Bible in that verse, lagos, or even rhema. It's aletheia, and it's the idea of truthfulness. That's what holds this Christian life together, the pillar and ground of truthfulness. You know, when people walk into our churches and our youth groups and our meetings, they should walk into an atmosphere of honesty, People who are genuinely talking about the things that are happening. Listen, why are our prayer meetings so dead, young people? It's because we're not actually talking about the things we need prayer for. Right. We're praying about our fish, sister's fish who died. You know, it's like, what? Give me a break. Who cares about that stupid cat? I mean, okay, the hamster, all right. But seriously, folks, you know, it's come to a point where all we're praying about is people with cancer and COVID. And, and the reality is, is we've got needs in our own lives, too. I'm not where I ought to be. And I just want to be honest today. I'll tell you, one of the prayer meetings we had up at the church plant in Shano was wonderful. It was just amazing. You want to know why? Because we had a new convert that came in that didn't know you shouldn't be honest in a prayer meeting. She sat down and she said, you know what, everybody, I'm really struggling with cigarettes. Can you pray for me? Everybody's like, ooh. And I'm like, praise the Lord, finally we're getting somewhere. Amen. People walk into our churches and they think, I can't be like you people. I don't know how to do this. Yeah. Like, don't be like us. Amen. We're faking it. <laughs> Come on. It's not real. We're not honest. We need to come into church and, and be honest. we got to stop pretending that we can use cuss words in the car and walk into church and, and, and proclaim God's name as being holy. We can't look at dirty stuff on the Internet and then come, come into God's presence. It doesn't work that way. Friends, we've we got to understand God's looking for honesty today. Amen. We need soldiers who aren't uh, being uh, shameful behind the line, who are walking honest before their God. You can't say you're walking in the light and walking in darkness at the same time. we got to be truthful. If you want this Christian life to go the way it ought to go, then, young people, 
we're just going to have to get honest. And you'd say, Pastor Weber, I, I understand that. I mean, that's the context of all this here, but you don't understand what the enemy's doing to me. Listen, I understand exactly what he's doing. He's using fear to shackle you. If I talk about this, or if I'm honest about that, or if I say this, then, 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 then it's never going to work. Listen, <clears throat> some of us are facing a Goliath in our life. I can spiritualize it that way. Goliath walked out as a champion of the Philistines. Look at the army of Israel. And those people, they were knee-knocking all over the place. All those big warriors, right? Eliab, all of David's brothers are out there. <laughs> and that's what we do. We look at these, these issues in our life. We look at this enemy as though somehow he has a greater power than our God. We look at him and we think, oh, no, if I say this or if I do that. What do you think? God's going to walk away from you? God's trying to develop a real relationship with you. He comes, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me. I will give you rest. The enemy puts you under this burden. He makes you fear. Fear is not from God. Amen. He hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind. Now it's time to think clearly about this, young people. Do you want to have a real relationship with God? God's not looking for your performance. Do you want to have something real? Then we need to resist the devil. We need to resist his fear. We need to resist his pressure. I find it interesting in that interaction with, with uh, David and Goliath, even, the, even his brothers were putting pressure on him to walk away. Sometimes even the peer pressure in our group, don't get up, don't say anything, don't do this. You, you don't want to look like a fool in front of everybody. Well, we heard what being a fool is so, uh, a couple nights ago. And we don't want to be a fool. We want to be a Christian who has a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, I, I echo the, the heart cry of Leonard Ravenhill. We don't need a new definition of Christianity. We need a new demonstration of Christianity. Amen. We need young people, this generation, to do something for God. And it's going to have to take honesty. You're going to have to stand up and say, hey, I need him today. I need help. I've got this issue. I'm not going to run anymore. I'm not going to hide. I'm not going to pretend. It's not real, but I know I can have it because the Bible says that I can. We've got to stop lying, young people. Because lying is only embracing the father of lies. It's not embracing the father of lights. Do you love him enough today? Will you let him love you enough today to talk to you about your sins? Will you trust him enough today to step out and be honest with the things that he's dealing with you about? Has he not proven himself to love you unconditionally and take care of you no matter what's going on? Can I give you a personal story? I struggle sometimes. I'd like to blame my past for a lot of the struggles I have, and I've done that. It's a weakness I have, but I have no reason to blame my past because I've got Jesus now. That's right, amen. But there's times when I get frustrated, and I've got kids, and for some odd reason I get frustrated with them because they're not perfect, and I guess I think they should be. And so sometimes I raise my voice when I know I shouldn't. And then I go into my room, and God sits on me. And he says, those vulnerable, sweet little kids, what is wrong with you? So I get up from my chair. I grab my kids and I sit down on my knees and I look them in the eyes. I said, that was not God. That was daddy in the flesh. And I'm so sorry. And you know the hardest part about that moment I thought would be saying I'm sorry. But the hardest part about that moment is when my kids turn. Hmm. 
And I, for the first time in my life, am experiencing unconditional love from somebody. When they wrap their arms around me, and they say, Daddy, we love you so much. And I'm looking into their eyes, and I'm seeing, as it were, the eyes of Jesus, as Peter did that night in his greatest failure. I'm seeing the eyes of love. Somebody I can trust. Somebody who I can be honest with, and they won't hurt me. How about you, young people? Is it real? Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the privilege that you give to come and share the wonderful truths, the wonderful words of life. Lord, I pray that you would life these young people here this morning, that they would embrace your love, that they would trust you with the things that you're working in their heart about, that, Lord, they'd be willing to get honest about the things that you're talking to them about. And, Lord, no matter what that means, maybe talking to a mom or a dad or just talking to you or whatever it means, but that, Lord, today would be a crowning day of great victory that would lead us into great times of fellowship with something real, something genuine, not something fake. Oh, Lord, deliver us from fake Christianity. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed here this morning. It's a past whoever God's working in my heart here this morning. God's doing something in my life about something real. I'm good at putting on a show, but I know it's not real. When you close this time, Pastor Weber, would you pray for me? By the uplifted hand, is there anybody like that here this morning? I see hands here, there. Yes, yes, thank you. All, all around, thank you. You may put them down. Anyone else? Pastor Weber, God's working in my heart here this morning. Maybe it's not something you talked about, but pray for me. God's doing some other things in my life. Would you pray for me? Anyone else? Thank you. Over here, yes, in the middle, all over. Yes, thank you. All over. The... Lord Jesus, I pray for my friends. Lord, my fellow co-workers in the harvest field. Lord, they're excited about what you want to do in their lives. And Lord, the shackles that the enemy has put around us using fear. He has gripped us, Lord. Set us free here today. Lord, what a powerful group of young people, wonderful young people that you want to use in a real way. I pray that you'd help them this morning. Guide them, Lord, into all truth. And Lord, set them free where the enemy has shackled them and paralyzed them. Lord, we pray that you'd do it here this morning. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed this morning. I think we've got some counselors in the back. Can we do that? Okay, great. If you need counseling this morning, why don't you just step up and slide right out of your seat. And I prayed for you. God's working in your heart, young people. Just step up and slide right out. There'll be counselors in the back. They'll, they'll, they'll pray with you. They'll encourage you. They'll help you. They'll help you to, to, to get into something real. Go ahead. Just go ahead and slide right out. Don't wait for somebody else to go. Uh, you just slide right out. You raised your hand. You need to deal with something. Just do that. Maybe it's something else that you need to talk to the Lord about. Just go ahead and do that here this morning. No pressure unless the Holy Spirit's putting his thumb on you. Then follow him. This is about reality. Reality means that you've got you to gotta take that step when he says go. Don't sit there and fake it. S just step up and go. You're among friends. We're, we're going to work together. Then we need to be honest together. We need to be honest together. Anyone else? Quite a few left. Anyone else want to slip out? Everybody's heads are bowed. You'd say, Pastor Weber, by the uplifted hand today, I know I'm right with God. Everything's right in my, in my life. I'm, I'm walking with the Lord. It's real. It's genuine. By the uplifted hand is a testimony. You would say, that's me. Okay, you may put your hands down. That was not all of you. And because it's not all of you, then let me ask those who didn't raise a hand. Why not make it real right now? Just stand up and walk out. You don't need music. You don't need any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else who wants it real? Just stand up and go. If you didn't, then come. All right, praise the Lord. Anyone else? It's all right, we got time. Most important thing right now is you being you. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else? God's working in your heart. You're wrestling, and I know you are. Listen, I've been there. I know what it's like to sit there and wrestle with God. Anyone else? All right. Anyone else? 
God's doing business. Anyone else? Thank you. Praise the Lord. There's still just a little bit here, a little bit there. We don't want to miss you. You got a wonderful opportunity to spend some time with the Lord in the next time, uh, session. Let's clear the deck. Let's just clear it all out. Let's be honest with God. Thank you. Good. Praise the Lord. They're still going. Holy Spirit's touching hearts. I understand what it's like. I don't want to end too soon here. Is there anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Praise the Lord. Yes. Anyone else? Amen. Anyone else? All righty. Well, I'll pray for you, and then maybe Brother Bosler will come. And, and uh, if you still need to do business with the Lord while I'm praying here, just go ahead and slip to the back. God's, God's working. That's okay. I'll pray for you, though. Lord, thank you again for these young people. Thank you so much uh, for their desire to serve you and to love you with all their hearts. Thank you, Lord, that they want to have something real. Lord, many of them uh, still need to deal with something. Lord, we don't want it to be synthetic here today. We, we want to help them. So, Lord, encourage them and talk to them. And, Lord, whatever it takes, uh, we want you to have the victory and breakthrough in their heart. Lord, you are our refuge today. We trust you. And I trust you with these young people. Do amazing things with them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.